Any time. Okay. We will call, then I will call the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District meeting of Board of Directors meeting of February 25th to order and ask for a roll call. Okay, uh, Director Downing. Here. Director Dutra. Here. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Here. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lind. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers. <clears throat> Present. Director Pegler. Here. Director Parker. Here. Director Peterson. Present. Director Rockton. Here. Uh, Ex officio Director Henderson. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. And we have quorum. Okay. And today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And uh, thank you, uh, Walter, for stepping in at the last moment to make this happen. Are there any other announcements? No. All right. Then we will move to uh, approving the board of board officers and committee appointments. And we have two slides, I believe. I would like to add a third. Okay. Uh, this is Mike Rotkin. Um, I, I, my slate is completely consistent. The, the first two slates are completely consistent as I understand them. There's no difference uh, in them right now unless I mis misread the packet. My third slate only changes one, uh, two, two areas. They're related to the RTC appointments and uh, basically um, reverses the um, uh, appointments of the uh, main appointees to the RTC and the alternates, and I'll explain why in a moment. But my, my slate would have RTC appointments as Kristen Peterson, Larry Pagler, and myself, Mike Rodkin, and the alternates would be Shebra, Colin Terry Johnson, Ari Parker, and Donald Lind. So what I've done basically is sw switched Larry Pegler and Ari Parker in these two appointments. And in, in that sense, my uh, slate is the same as, uh, at least in terms of the RTC, as Donald Lind's initial uh, slate, she, which she then changed to be the same as uh, Manu Koenig's second slate. So that's, that is my slate. And if I can make a comment now about that, I, I will do it. Go ahead. Okay, well, first I wanna say, the transit district does a lot of different things and this is but one issue. And uh, it's very possible for us to disagree about things and um, not make, you know, and still get along and work hard together on a whole bunch of other things that are important. So this is not the only issue before this body. Secondly, um, the reason I'm doing this is because I think the public are often confused about how certain outcomes come about and what happened and what's going on. And um, I'm not sure that my slate will have any success in attracting other voters than myself, but I'd like people to understand uh, what, what's motivating this. Um, it's most important to say this is not a personal attack on anybody. As you'll see, this what's switched here is Ari Parker. I don't know Ari Parker, um, but I have no reason to think that she's other than a dedicated public servant and means to do well as a transit district board member. However, um, and let me just begin with uh, some basic facts. Um, and, and another thing to say is nobody here is doing anything illegal or immoral or uh, any inappropriate, um, but I want the public to understand what what's going on in these appointments to the RTC. So here's some facts. We purchased a rail corridor, the RTC purchased a rail, and you'll see that this is connected to the transit district, even though I'm talking about the RTC in, in part of this. Purchased a rail corridor for passenger rail service uh, in 2012. We, in the last 10 years, we've spent millions of dollars and been involved in a lot of meetings and studies planning that passenger rail service. Um, and uh, Metro has been involved in this. We were one of the active partners in putting on the TCAA, the, the Transit Quarter uh, Alternatives Analysis, that selected passenger rail as the preferred alternative. Um, Watsonville City Council, has consistently supported rail uh, through the county through a resolution to the RTC. And as, unless I missed count, uh, I understand that currently there's five members of the Watsonville City Council who support rail and two who are not rail supporters. 
Um, for reasons that I don't understand and don't need to, ultimately, the Watsonville City Council appointed the two uh, non-rail supporters to the, to the Santa Cruz Metro. Um, Mike, don't spew lies. I, I, where, if you can find where, where I've ever said that I do not support rail. Jimmy, let then him you, finish, then you, you can You need to on. show it, otherwise. Let's, let me, let me move on if I could, Jimmy, certainly respond. I won't have the last word on this, I'm sure. Um, the, uh, as a result, the council now is looking at appointments to the RTC and reasonably enough, commissioners are trying to, as we have pretty consistently, you know, make sure that Watsonville is represented and that's what I believe has led to the uh, switch from uh, Donald Lynn's initial uh, uh, nominations for the, for the RTC appointments. Um, however, people need to be aware that, again, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, we'll find that out, but that I believe what will happen is that we will have, instead of the current 6-6 six, six tie that is, um, has the RTC at loggerheads, we'll end up with a 7-5 uh, split on the uh, RTC that is basically not supportive of rail. And um, as a result, there'll be consequences. I, who knows what those long-term consequences may be. Uh, rail still, uh, abandoning rail still would require an adverse abandonment, which is not particularly popular, judging by the last RTC meeting. Um, so it's not clear exactly what the final outcome will be. But I'm, I think it makes a difference who, who the transit district sends over there. And since our policy has been supportive of rail, it, to me, it's important that we send people who support our past policy on this question. And we have not voted to change that policy in some way. So that's the reason for my alternative slate. Again, it's not an attack on Ari Parker and her character or anything else about what you might do in life or how we, we might, as I, for example, with Jimmy, we've, Jimmy and I have worked together closely on a lot of different issues. This is not a personality attack. This is not a... Uh, belief that anybody's doing anything wrong. It's just, I, to me, it's important that the transit district be consistent in its support of the rail project and be clear about our desire to do so. So that's the reason for my alternative slate for that one, for those two positions, the, the main RTC appointments and the alternate uh, appointments to that position. Thank you. Mike, would you mind repeating your slate? I'm just taking notes. Yes, my slate is for the, uh, the main appointments to the RTC are Kristen Peterson, Larry Pegler, that's consistent with the other two slates, and, and, and Mike Rot and Mike Rotkin. Um, and what's not consistent with the other two is Larry Pegler. On the other slates, Larry Pegler is an alternate, and this in mine, he's the main appointee to the RTC. Is that clear? Peterson, Pegler, and Rotkin. And the alternates are Sheber Collin, Terry Johnson, Ari Parker, and Donald Lynn, moving Ari Parker from the main appointment to the alternate appointment. So in effect, what I've done is switched Larry and Ari in the two appointments in my slate. So, so to be clear, then your wait, slate wait. Is, is Peterson, Parker, and Rotkin then? Yes, that's correct. For the, for the RTC and the alternates, which we also have to appoint, the alternate slate is Sheber Collin, Terry Johnson, Ari Parker, and Donald Lynn. And otherwise, I have no, there's nothing, my slate has no changes to any of the other appointments uh, that are consistent with both of the other two slates at this point. And Director Dutra. I, I first want to say, Mike, unless you can find something where I said I've never supported rail, you shouldn't be spewing that kind of like false information. I mean, you're, but you're, you should be above that. You know, the problem here is that this has become really political and it's become about the rail trail. Like the, you go to any sort of meeting, the only question people care about from the North is about the rail trail. They don't care about, you know, people's rights or whether or not you support, um, you know, anti-choice groups or, or if they, you choice, whatever. It's all about the rail trail. And we're really moving away from what the reality of this board is supposed to be doing. And that is supposed to be about getting people up and down the community from Watsonville to Davenport. You know, we, you, this this board uses our numbers in South County to get grant funding and to, and to get um, a lot of a lot of the money that comes into this board happens because of the people of our community. You you that so to deny us from having a voice in any part, whether it's on the executive team or on the RTC, shame on you. I, I don't see how anyone can sit here and actually think in good faith that this is something that a good moral person would do. Yeah, I have to sit here and I have to defend myself. I have to defend my city and defend Ari because we're two voices out of 11. We are the minority on this board. And I hope you can all sit there and think about that for a minute. You want to, I'm upset. And I, you know what? And a logical person will understand why I'm upset. 
said. You are blocking us out, but yet using our numbers for funding for this system. Look at the board, look what it looks like. It lacks diversity. I am the only Latino sitting on this board. Director yeah, Parker. Yeah, too. And then it, and it, so let me tell you that it's not right to be, you know, shutting us out like this because you're, and you're, and thank you for being honest, Mike. At least you said that this vote is about the rail. I don't ever remember it here at the bus at Metro voting on whether um, we're going to support. Maybe it happened before I was on the board. It could have, but I, I don't remember that. I didn't vote. I wasn't part of a vote for that. Yeah, it did. We had that vote. But go on. I, didn't, I don't mean to interrupt. Go on. That's okay. You can interrupt me. No, I, 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 I want to be, I want to make sure, I want to make sure accurate information gets out. So yes, thank you, Mike. So the vote happened before I was on the board. Between, so, your, between your services on the board, actually, Jenny. Yes, you were on the board earlier. And, my service. Thank right. you, Mike. But I wasn't voting. I did not vote on it. That's so, correct. So I, I want factual information to go out of here. I, I go out into the public. So for you to sit there and say, and I don't think Ari's ever made her opinion about what she feels about the rail trail. I mean, she can speak for herself, but like, you know, I, it, for you to be saying this and, you know, putting like the scarlet letter on us, <laughs> I mean, this makes, it's going to make it very difficult for us to get anything done in this board. I mean, we're going to be sitting here, the two members from South County are going to be continually, continuously fighting to get our fair share down there. We already gave up when, let's remember, let's go back. There were supposed to be, both stations were supposed to be redone. Who gave up the who gave up the, the opportunity to have their station redone, but just took a paint job and added some murals? Who did that? That was us in South County, while North County is moving forward with theirs. So if we're going to talk about equity, you guys need to make sure there's representation in the positions that our voices can be heard. Because right now, this actions of some of the board members do not show that. You're nice to our faces, but when it comes down to it, we don't get the same results that other parts of this county does. So I'm really disappointed. Director Parker. Put my hand down. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you, Jimmy. Um, you no, know, he's not the only Latino. Uh, I am a Latina as well, a Native American. Uh, it just shows we're California, because that's, you know, when you, when you judge a book by its cover. Um, I do appreciate, I want to say, first of all, uh, directors, that have reached out to talk to me to kind of get a sense of who I am. Uh, and uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you very much for having those conversations. Uh, I did not receive a call or any communication from Director Rotkin. I would have been happy to speak with you about that. Um, as being on the council, I, I think there's a couple points to be made here. Um, uh, you know, if, if I had your ability, Director Rotkin, to foresee the future, how rich would I be? <laughs> Because you're just putting out uh, thoughts about where you don't want it to go. So you think based on I don't know what. The only time I've ever dealt with rail and trail uh, really was just about rail. And my vote was affirmative uh, at the time um, with a, a lot of comments about why don't they start in Watsonville since we're going to have the connectors into Monterey uh, to the rest of the state rather than start on the other end of the county, but I still voted affirmatively. Other than that, I have not uh, spoken about it uh, and, and actually gotten out there and, and said one way or the other. And I do have to make a point that it is telling that the city council, and you asked that question, why would the city council send two people who are anti -ra? They appointed us. I think they know who we are. I think we know they know that there were strong advocates for South County. We're strong advocates for Metro. And that's why they appointed us. And that's why we're here. Uh, when we go to the RTC, that's where the money talks. And I think that's the important part. And, uh, and Director Dutra really spoke to that when it came to the fact that, you know, we've been kind of shut out uh, of that conversation because it's been about rail and trail. I want to make it about Metro. This is about Metro. This is about infrastructure. This is about infrastructure that supports Metro. And that's how I feel. So um, I appreciate you have another slate, but thank you once again to all, all the directors who actually uh, called and, and have spoken to me. And, um, and I hope I've been able to clarify uh, a little bit about who I am. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Director Koenig. Thank you, Chair Lynn. 
Uh, I did, first of all, I just wanted to point out that um, I think there was one other difference in the slates that were proposed, and that was um, in slate two proposing uh, uh, Director Dutra for vice chair um, instead of Bruce McPherson for vice chair, Larry uh, still as chair. Um, so that was one difference for that position. I'm sorry if I mis misread that. Sorry. No worries. Um, and then, you know, just it's you know good to hear about the uh, the past votes that this board has taken uh, in support of rail, um, and I think that brings up a good point, which is that um, this this board as a whole has the ability to direct uh, its representatives on the RTC to vote in a way um, that that we feel is in the best interest of Metro. And so whoever we decide to send to the RTC, we always have that ability. Uh, to re-examine what is in the best interest of this agency, uh, the transit agency that we have today and that, that does move uh, a, a lot of people. Um, and I, there is new information coming out of the RTC, which may cause us to want to re-examine that uh, with Metro. And, and in particular, we're seeing that um, the two existing rail bridges in Aptos are actually restricting uh, and, and may limit our ability to complete the bus on shoulder project all the way to freedom. Um, and so I think that given that new information, it's very likely our board will want to re-examine that position in the future, uh, given some of the, the cost figures coming out of the RTC. Um, so uh, I'll just leave it at that and say that I do support uh, having South County representation, both on the executive, uh, in, in among the executive team, uh, as well as on the RTC, because, um, I mean, hey, they, they see, they feel the pain more than uh, any other group in our county, they see the challenges with existing transportation and transit, um, and I do think it's important that they're represented. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, Director McPherson. I think Ari should be, uh, the South County should be represented on the RTC. I'll leave it there. And I have a couple hands in the public. Brian from Trail Now. Thank you. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Uh, we're a organization with thousands of local supporters. Um, of interest is um, we were a political action committee in 2015, actually that opposed Measure D originally because Measure D came out with 24% funding for rail, including a Monterey Bay, Monterey County train station. Zach Friend and um, Mayor Don Lane at the time changed the language uh, and moved 24% down to 8% for keeping the track, keeping the rail corridor, maintaining it. And that money was transferred to Metro. We then became a supporter. And our, our, our supporters actually contribute the most to the funds, my understanding is. My, myself, Brian Peoples, I've been in transportation for over 20 years, been involved in the Regional Transportation Commission for more than 20 years. I've written a state bill to give tax credits to corporations for people to ride Metro. I've actually was on the Silicon Valley leadership group, starting shuttles to Caltrans. I have a passion for transit. We believe in widening highway and having buses running up and down. I think that the idea of not having a representative um, from Watsonville is not fair to Watsonville for the RTC board. We are hopeful that Metro is fair to Watson. They're the ones that truly need bus support, transportation support. So for the board to go and, and not have a, a representative from South County is, is unheard of. I've actually, I've never experienced it. And I've been going to the regular meetings for over a decade of the RTC. And then finally, I'll point out that um, we really truly need the representatives to be elected people. Uh, what we've experienced with Mr. Rockins, for example, is he was not elected. So he, he doesn't have any uh, skin in the game. And it was obvious when he was working to bring in um, a, a private company for tourist trains along our corridor. 
and have money go and fund the tourist trade. We, that's not what we need. We need money to go to Metro. And we proved it when we supported Measure D. We're behind you. We want to expand Metro. So again, please uh, think about not having a non-voted elected person on Metro, on the RTC. And secondly, Watsonville should have a representative. Thank you for your time. Thank you. James Sandoval. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, James Sandoval here, General Chairperson for Smart Local 283, who represents the bus drivers and paratransit drivers at Metro. And I just want to speak out in support of Director Koenig's uh, slate. Um, no, uh, you know, this is in no way any offense to um, Director um, Bruce McPherson and Larry Pegler. You know, I, I have a pretty good relationship with them. It's, and it's more about uh, bringing a voice to Watsonville. Um, I've been born and raised in Watsonville, I understand. Um, and I, I felt it too, where we need strong voices for um, the community of Watsonville. And over two thirds of our drivers at Metro live in Watsonville. So we also. We lost you there. Can you hear me? Yes. We did. We were doing okay, sorry. I'm on my phone. Somebody called. Sorry. Um, so I, I just want to speak out in support of that. Talking with many drivers, we all support the idea of bringing more of a voice for Watsonville. You know, as Jimmy and Ari mentioned, there's two voices on this board from Watsonville when they represent nearly 55,000 people, you know, compared to the Santa Cruz, which is about 60,000. So it's it's very similar, yet Wattsville has two people on our board. And they're supposed to bring the voice from Wattsville onto this board. And one way of making sure there's balance throughout our community is making sure Wattsville also has a voice. And it is about equity. And um, I just wanted to make sure this board knows that we need to bring um, a balanced voice on this board and um, and we uh, strongly support Ari Parker on the RTC and Jimmy Dutra as being the vice chair uh, for this board of directors. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Downey. Yeah, I don't, I haven't met any, most of you, and uh, I live in a rather relatively small community, but of the daily commute does run through Aptos. So, I feel that it's really important for the Metro reps that are on the RTC to reflect the entire county. And uh, actually, I believe the RTC's bylaws state that the members have to represent the entire county. So it would make sense that the Metro reps uh, also represent the entire county, no matter who those choices are. Um, I think that I started working on that a while ago because the Metro bylaws don't really state that. And I think it's important that that representation happen. Um, since we're the choke point, I really appreciate having representatives from Watsonville uh, on the RTC because you sort of help us. We're not quite as far south as Watsonville, but we are part of the southern part of the county. I lived in Watsonville for 10 years before I lived to Ap moved to Aptos. So I feel that that community really should probably have more representation than they do now. So um, I think it's important to make sure that the, the group that goes to the RTC looks like the entire county. Thank you, Director Downing. I see smart local, I think that's Nate. With a hand up, had had a hand up, and I see a couple more, so I will call on each of you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, yes, uh, Nate Abrego. Um, I am a, a union representative for Smart Local 0023, representing the uh, Paracruz and the bus operators. But um, I, I want to speak on a on a personal note from. Being a, a longtime South County Watsonville resident and living there for most of my life, uh, you know, my parents are from the Pajaro Valley and Salinas Valley areas. Um, 
And as a young man, I, I use the bus uh, system uh, quite often, you know, almost daily. And, and it was, um, it's uh, public transportation has been a, a big part of, of my life and helping me become the man that I am, the person that I am. Uh, I think it's very important that South County uh, continue to have uh, proper representation in, 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 in all the uh, uh, boards and, and committees uh, making these, uh, these choices for transportation in our, in our county. It's extremely important. And I think uh, uh, one of the, as one of the communications to the board, uh, the La Selva Beach area um, that's on there today, it, it, it just goes to show how important uh, representing these uh, underserved uh, communities uh, is. Thank you. Thank you. And Holly Alcorn. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Board of Representatives and members of the public. I'm Holly Alcorn and I'm the Vice President of Metro's SEA Chapter of SEIU 521. Today, I wanted to advocate for a position on the agenda that item is supporting Manu's nominations for executive board positions. We support Manu's slate two for the main purpose of boosting Watsonville's constituency's influence on our board. Jimmy Dutra's support of our SEIU members, as well as his voice for the underrepresented group in the county, makes it clear where we need to show our support. We ask the board to understand the importance of the second slate, being more representative of the entire county for transportation needs. We're always evaluating our community's needs and it's easy and conscious, conscious decision to help bring the unrepresented community members into this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. And uh, Director Northcutt. Next fish. Thank you. Um, I don't know if my thing is on, but it's I on. am, thank you. I am um, kind of offended that this is a conversation. Um, the fact that we are asking to be a part of a conversation that should include us naturally. Um, as a representative for Cabrillo, who brought a lot of our funds to Metro to provide services to South County because of the lack of transportation and access to it, it would seem to me that the best interest would continue to have a voice on that board that provided that extra support and um, resource uh, allocations. And so RTC, in my short time serving on it as the interim, um, has kind of lost its conversation as it relates to the metro and the public transportation access. And it's time for that conversation to be um, rehashed. And I don't think we need to be focusing on how much power we give to North while we're excluding the voice of the South. I think our conversation needs to be who's the best representative inclusive of the South. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we've called on everyone. I see James's hand still up, but we've already, he's already spoken. So is there anyone else who has not? Oh, Director Koenig. Uh, Chair, if, it, if it's appropriate, uh, I would just like to move slate two. Uh, Actually, there's a process that I think the chair is in charge of uh, managing right, right, right. How, the, how the vote takes place. Well, my first was just to be sure we'd called on everyone who's had an opportunity. <clears throat> and then my understanding is that we start with the slate first, first slate, and then go to the second, as that's my understanding. And I will say that uh, I want to point out that Director Dutra was our chair the last time his just prior to leaving council. So we have certainly not excluded South County from uh, serving on the executive board. So, um, and I agree that uh, representation needs to be equitable, so. The... Yeah, I wanna be clear, uh, when the slate is made that we identify exactly what we're voting on, um, if it's the entire slate or is it just the RTC component of that? Well, Amanda pointed out that it's not just the RTC, yeah, his slate, no, his slate, correct me, Amanda, if I misunderstood it, that his slating uh, switches um, Jimmy Dutra in for Bruce McPherson. Is that correct, Amanda? 
That's correct for the vice chair position. Yeah. Those are the, so those are the, there's three positions that are, so well, I mean, what might be appropriate is to approve uh, the entire slate okay. except, except those three and then just deal with those. But I'll leave it to the chair how she's gonna handle it. Okay, first of all, I wanna just defer to our city, or to our attorney. My, my understanding is we start <coughs> order of these slates. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So the first slate is, is, can we do a screen save on that or a screen share on that? No, okay. No. Um, so, could we get clarification from Director Rockkin for the Personnel HR Standing Committee? Um, just because there are two different uh, directors up for vice chair, could you clarify your position of uh, candidate or for uh, nominees? And my, mine's consistent with slate one. Okay. Uh, if I understand correctly, which is uh, just to be clear, um, that the vice chair uh, be Bruce McPherson. Okay. And then the other two uh, directors would be Jimmy Dutra and Kristen Peterson. Oh. There's five people on there. I thought the two slates were consistent for the personnel committee. Am I wrong? Uh, what changes is the um, uh, because of the vice chair. So the first three positions are automatic. It's the current board chair, current vice chair, and then the immediate past chair with two other directors. And so it kind of gets a little mixed up uh, because of the different vice chair. Right, but that, that will follow automatically based on who is elected to these different positions, though, chair and vice chair and so forth. In other words, it, 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 we don't actually, we're not having a separate vote in a way on that. Whoever wins, whoever gets appointed on the vice chair position will end up being the person that's appropriately, you know, part of the other, that other committee. So I'm not suggesting okay. anything other than that, whatever, whichever, and it wouldn't matter if I did, because whichever, whoever wins the vice chair position, uh, will automatically be the person that's on that personnel committee. And I'm not challenging how that process works. Donna, okay. do you need any other clarifications? So I think, it, is everyone clear on with the no. first slate? No, uh, I, I, okay. is it the whole slate? You know, the yes. chair, vice chair, all the way down? Yes. I think that uh, there are times where we have made some adjustments to committees because people have requested. I mean, last time there were, um, we had appointed people to a committee and then they, some of them had not come on to the board. So we made a change by request of committees separately, other committees if, if, if a member said they could not serve, but otherwise it'll be the whole slate as, and um, so first slate, the only difference was um, that I had Bruce McPherson as vice chair and uh, Mono has, um, Jimmy Dutra as vice chair. So I think everything else was consistent. Is that correct, Director uh, Tonic? I'm just curious. So are we going to vote for each position independently? No, uh, full or... slate. That's what I was just, that's what Bruce was asking. It'd be a full slate unless someone, uh, I would say if someone has, I would be open if someone says, has a suggestion or if we get stuck in a, uh, you know, in a vote, then we can talk about an individual one if that's the case. Well, I'll tell you, it's going to put me in a position to vote no on something, and I want the representation of RTC in the South County. So uh, I, I might just abstain then. I believe that, so if I understand correctly, Chair Lynn, your slate one is now, it now includes Bruce McPherson for vice chair and Ari Parker uh, on the RTC. That's correct. That's correct. Right. It's the same as yours with the only difference is the chair, vice chair. Understood. Yeah, let me just make sure, does everyone have Donna Lynn's revised slate that was sent to the board, I believe, yesterday? Yes. Okay. So I shouldn't speak for everybody. I do. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I'm a little confused. We can't put this up on a screen so that everyone, including the public, can see this because it's all part of the agenda, but it's several pages long. Yeah, so I know. I'm, I'm looking at it, uh, yeah. and I'm just saying there's no way to. Uh, I mean, you want to share? It with I me, asked, I'll put it up. <laughs> well, I don't know. I asked Donna if she could do that. I don't know that. Uh, what I don't the, have that on. I'm on a laptop. I don't have. 
it on this one. Um, Julie? If somebody else wants to, to throw it up there, if that's, uh, if Walter can allow that. So, yeah, I mean, one way is to look on the, the Metro website. It is on the website. Yes. We could try to do a screen share. I'm, I'm terrible at this stuff, but I can give it a try. Well, um, it, it would be really good for the public as well as for us to be on the same page. So if somebody wanted to pull, for example, you could say, I, I agree with all the slates except for, I say no to that one. And, I believe I can you know, share this. Would you like me to try? Sure. I was just seeing if I could. You there see you anything? Yep. Yes. yep. I can't see it. So you'll have to tell me, but that's uh, the first decision, and I can go through page by page if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. One. So first we're looking at slate one. Correct. And you'll see slate two below that, Mike. Both. Yeah. Right? Yes. This is the first this that is the first be... difference. Right. Bruce mm -hmm. McPherson on slate one, Jimmy Dutra on slate two. And again, just so we make it clear all together, this three, slate three is the same as slate one for this position. Right. I don't know whether I should raise my hand because this is a new uh, place for me because people just tend to talk out and I, I want to be respectful to the chair. So I'm, I'm going to raise my hand again and say, Thank you. Uh, yes, I, and um, uh, I, I want to know that, um, are we going to, there was mention that we were going to do all the slates, but now that we can see it, can we vote per slate, make it very simple and clear for the public as we move through Well, what in the we order would... in which it's there? Generally, it would say you would you could generally there's a motion on the first slate, then you take the second slate. Chris, sounds good. Okay. So, Thank Ari, you for Ari, that Ari the, the problem is that you have to, uh, under the rules of the Brown Act from the state legislature for COVID conditions, we, we'd have to have a roll call vote on every one of these. And we'll be here for about an hour just on the roll call votes on little committees where there's no disagreement. I'm, I'm okay with taking a roll call <laughs> vote if that's the case. I think that's yeah. uh, it helps it has uh, to the be. clarity. Yeah. yeah, it has to be it's just rather we want to go through 15, all, every single committee in position and roll call vote on every can, item. May I ask another a clarifying question yes. then? Can we pull, can uh, the folks here, uh, the directors here, pull the ones that they feel like they might have be a little controversial? We can clean up the other slates and then go with a roll call vote on those individuals? But I would say, yeah, I would say the two slates are identical except for um, two of them, except for the vice chair position. And Chris and Peterson, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry. I just, I, it seemed like maybe there was some confusion in the difference between voting on a slate and voting on a particular position or committee. Right. And I was just, uh, you know, at one point looking for some kind of clarification amongst people who were asking questions about can we vote on each slate? if they were referring specifically to where it says slate one for each and every committee in position, or if they were saying that they wanted to pull a specific committee or position off entirely and vote on that separately, because I think that we're kind of cross talking in a way that's blurring the lines between the difference of a slate and a committee or position. Agreed. The slate does include all committees. And like I said, slate one and two are the same except for the vice chair. So all the committees, and I know I personally had contacted each of you to see is everyone comfortable with the committees they're serving on. And there were no changes recommended by either any of us other than, uh, well, either the first two are identical except for vice chair. Every, every committee, everything's the same. And the third is the difference only in, in uh, from mine in the RTC representation. So all the other committees are the same. Did that help clarify? So one and two are the same except for vice chair. And then you heard Mike's recommendation on his third slate. Would you like me to scroll through the rest of this? Does anyone want uh, to see all the committees to go down the various pages? I don't think we really need we, we might no. might do might do this one. We've done this one. You might look now to the RTC, Larry, if you could bring those sure. up. Uh, just because there, there's yeah. no different. I'll say there's no difference in the two slates on that for one and two, but mine is different. The slate three is different on that one. Uh, sorry, I skipped one. There we are. Yeah. So the, slates one and two. 
Right, so th that's for one and two is the same. And slate three switches Ari Parker and uh, Larry Pagler. Right. That's the only change. That's what slate three does, just to be clear about what we're voting on. And the slate does include all committees, but again, there are no changes. So right. uh, generally, is there a motion starting with slate one? Is there a motion for approval of slate one? Okay. And is there a motion for approval of slate two? I'll move approval of slate two. I'll second. Motion by Koenig, second by Dutra. So, why, go back again. When okay. you had the first Did question you asked was, you didn't sorry. get a motion on slate one, but I'm sure Bruce, for example, supports slate one. He said he did. Yeah, I, I would I would move to support slate one. We should do it in the right order according well, to Well, I did. I just maybe didn't give you enough time to respond. Oh, I think there was enough time to just respond. That, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, would have, I would have seconded that motion, but I was moving the screen around. Sorry. Oh, we do have a motion and a second for slate one. And now we'd start with a roll call vote. Okay. Uh, for slate one, Director Downing. Nay. Director Dutra. Nay. Director Colin Terry Johnson. No. Director Koenig. No. Director Lind. No. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. That's my slate. Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. No. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. No. Director Peterson. No. Director Rockin. No. All right. Okay. Now, is there a mo we'll go back to the motion for the second slate. Can I can I suggest there's no need to you have a majority on slate one and it's uh Director Rockin? I'm no, sorry. No, I take it back. You're right. It failed. So now we go to slate. Is three. it possible yes. that we can let a Mayor Lynn run the meeting? <laughs> just, sure. I'm just confused. No, I, you're right. Go on to slate I, two. Go ahead. So we had a motion. Could we repeat that motion? I believe the motion was first by Koenig, Koenig and, and by second by Dutra. Oh, Dutra, sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lind? No. Director McPherson? No. Director Myers? Aye. Uh, Director Pegler? Aye. Director Parker? Yes. Director Peterson? Aye. And Director Rockin? No. Now you've got a majority. Was recording very interesting in progress. Thing, if you care to go through it. Uh, and we have the letter from La Selva Beach Improvement Association. Any information on any of these uh, from Don or staff? Comments from the board? No. Hearing none. Labor organization communication. No, this, no, this is your chance for oral communication from the public. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any comments from the public on these items? No, well, I meant in general, this is the opportunity for the world communication on items, not our agenda. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, any comments from the public on items that are not on the agenda? I see a hand from N. Martinez. Uh, do I have the ability to turn this on or off or? 
what, what? Donna will tell, Donna will. There we go. go Thank you, Donna. Okay. Hello, thank you, thank you. everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak here today. I'm representing my family members who live and work in the Santa Cruz County and are associated with transit and invested in the needs of the Santa Cruz County public via the transit services. Um, I've also worked with an exceptional amount of clients um, from Santa Cruz County <clears throat> who have used public transit to um, just daily as they um, live their lives. So. Um, let's see. I noticed in the agenda for this meeting that item 7.1 labor organization communication presented by SMART and SEIU is a thank you for thank you for your support flyer. Can you clarify that this uh, thank what this thank you flyer was for? It looks like it was for eight board members <clears throat> for signing. <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> sorry, I've been waiting for a while. No water. It looks like uh, it was for eight board members for signing and supporting the request of Santa Cruz Metro to be part of the Public Employment Relations Board. Uh, this flyer also indicates that this item will be introduced into legislation soon. During the last board meeting on 1-28-22, one board member requested this item to be reviewed and presented to the full board after a new CEO is hired. I'm a little confused <clears throat> um, and not really sure how this item already received the approval of the eight board members, because um, it doesn't seem like it was previously in the agenda for the public to hear and review or participate in. Um, so I'm just wondering if you're aware of this um, and per the, or if you're aware that for the Brown Act, uh, this creates specific agenda obligations for notifying the public um, in this regard. Um, so I'm wondering if this was a violation of the Brown Act, um, specifically section 54950. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, staff or Julie, any response? Sure. Um, thank you for your comment. I can certainly you know, research whether this was a violation of the Brown Act. Um, I was not privy to the conversations of when this letter was circulated and signed by the board members. The only official action of the board that the board took was tabling this action until after a CEO was hired and the board was committed to agendizing a discussion of PERB jurisdiction within three months of that CEO's engagement. And that is the only official action of the board that this board took. Um, but I can certainly look into what, what this is about and respond back. Thank you, Julie. Any other questions from the board? Uh, looking to the public, I don't see any more hands. Moving to the next item, labor organization communications. Do we have anything else from our folks? I see James Sandoval. James? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay, I got a couple of things. First off, congratulations, Larry. Uh, I'm excited about you being chair. Um, I'm excited that the slate was accepted, as is, for slate number two. Um, just a fun fact about Larry Pigler. He is so passionate about transit. He sits in our SPARC meetings, which is the Service Planning and Review Committee meeting for Metro that runs the service and talks about how to make our you know, routes more efficient and stuff. And uh, he makes almost every meeting. Um, so I'm just really excited about having somebody so passionate about transit and that's going to take Metro in the right direction. And um, uh, just in, and another thing back to uh, the comments over the slates, like I just want to vouch for uh, both uh, Director Jimmy Dutra and Ari Parker. They have not taken a position on the trail corridor or the train. Um, I, Jimmy was asked this during an endorsement process and he just, you know, his his comment was to let the community decide. So. Um, I just wanted to make sure that was known about that. And uh, going back to the uh, thank you flyer for clarification, um, basically legislation doesn't require board support. You know, um, we were working with uh, Senator John Laird over legislation to bring unfair labor practice mitigation to Metro. And we got a consensus from this board from my understanding that uh, they, they support 
this, which is basically um, going to bring protections to workers that you know we never had before, and it's just basically to make sure that we're always bargaining in good faith. Um, and uh, that thank you flyer, as you could see, includes um, quite a few board members, including ex officio Alta Northcutt. And uh, these are basically people that have spoke up in support of this legislation and the idea. And so um, I, we just felt the need to, you know, it's the least we could do is to, you know, let these board members know how grateful for we are to uh, bring um, labor harmony to Metro. And uh, we're just hoping that, you know, consensus or sentiment continues as um, our legislation moves forward. So thank you. I just want to clarify that. Thank you, James, and I appreciate the comments. I'll see you at the next SPARC meeting. Uh, Director Myers, I see your hand. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations, Larry. Thank you. I've known you a long time, so I can't think of a better chair for us this year. Um, yeah, I just want to re remark on this item um, and the flyer. Um, I do want the board to, again, understand my my statement at the last meeting, which um, I was supportive of bringing this to the entire board. Um, I understood there was various agenda issues, um, didn't get on the agenda, was supportive of having a conversation at the board um, in a transparent, openly public way. Um, and despite many conversations with Mr. Sandoval and very direct responses to him, um, I was unable to get uh, what I was expressing done with working with Mr. Sandoval, which initially I had signed that letter via the email request. Uh, I then, within about a 10-minute period, requested that the signature be taken off. Um, this was after a few phone calls that I was able to finally have with various uh, folks to find out more about um, you know, where we are heading with this. And I made the conclusion that I would like to see the full board, that this should be noticed publicly and that should be openly discussed by our board. It's an important decision. Um, I'm not saying I'm supportive one way or the other, but my main uh, point was that I wanted to have a board discussion. Um, I explained this to Mr. Sandoval many times, and I repeated that I would like to have my signature taken off the item. Uh, despite being very frank about that, I continued to receive communications from Mr. Sandoval over and over and over throughout the weekend, right up to an important board meeting that I was attending as a general manager running my agency. <laughs> um, and during that, uh, I just could not handle any more of the text. My signature is still on this document, but I want this board to know that I would prefer, and I think everyone needs to consider, that this should be done in a transparent, noticed board discussion. So I want to state that today. Um, I think this was um, not well done. Um, and I will say I've talked with Senator Laird about um, this. and. Um, you know, I just don't think this was a good process at all. And I just want to publicly put that out there to my colleagues. So thank you. Thank you, Director Myers. I see Director McPherson's hand. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the explanation and I've heard that that uh, from Director Myers, but I just want to say how disappointed I am. I didn't, I didn't think uh, many members of this board followed the spirit of the directive of the entire board. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of complications. So very disappointing. Thank you, Director McPherson. Any other comments from the board? All right. I'll just I'll just please I'll just, Mike, go ahead. Just associate myself with Bruce's comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right. We were on to the next item. Uh, any additional documentation for the existing agenda? Donna, do we have anything more? Uh, I sent out the slides to support item 12 uh, to the directors yesterday, and then those will get added to uh, the agenda online. Great. All right. Thank you. That brings us to the consent agenda. Are there any items on the agenda that uh, directors care to address separately? 
or members of the public who are interested in those? None. Do I have a motion for move, a, move approval of the consent agenda? I'll second it. We have a motion by Rockman and Myers, I think was the second. Okay. All right. Can we have a vote on that, please? Uh, Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Oh, you're muted, right. Bruce. Okay. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you. Well, we're on to our regular agenda, and I believe I get to read the Employee Longevity Awards. And of course, that would be when my phone would go off. A moment. Thank you. All right, we have three individuals we're honoring for 10 years of service to the Metro. I'm going to read these pieces for them. Uh, the first is Uriel Estrada. Uriel started working for Santa Cruz Metro. Sorry, as a mechanic one and was promoted to mechanic two. Uriel continued to move up by promoting to lead mechanic in 2019. During work hours, Uriel enjoys the challenges of his daily duties and his camaraderie of his coworkers. Uriel has a passion for passing on experience, knowledge, and aid to other mechanics. Uriel has a wife and two sons. On his time off, Uriel really enjoys camping and a great outdoors. I appreciate those years of service and I hope you stay with us for quite a while to come. Marie Hoyos. Marie enjoys providing safe transportation and courtesy to the public and makes it seem easy. Before starting as a bus operator for Metro, she protected employees and the public as part of her duties as a security officer. She made the decision to become a bus operator and has since been able to have a family and raise her children with her husband, who is also a bus operator. Her calm demeanor and smooth driving have always been appreciated by her passengers. And last, Paul Lennon. Paul's career here with Metro started as a paracruise operator. He enjoyed his interactions with the passengers and being a part of their lives. Paul decided to come over to fixed routes and has enjoyed the challenges of fixed route along with his passengers' interactions. Paul is always in a good mood and always has a smile for his coworkers and passengers. On his time off, he enjoys outdoor activities and spending time with his family. And Paul is someone I personally knew before he came to Metro. So congratulations to all three of these folks. We care to have a hand, whatever we do. Thank you. Next item, approval to pre-fund the first principal and interest payment. That comes from Chuck Farmer. Chuck? Hi. Thank, I'm going to share something because I, what I want to do is, as I previously understand, I want to kind of give you the results of our sales of our bonds for repurchasing. Or let me uh, see. Are you able to share your screen? Good. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go in here and give you a quick little summary. So, uh, you know, basically we sold the sales tax revenue bond. So a little bit of history, you know, we looked at the unfunded liability. It was 68.1 million. And at the time, CalPERS rate, discount rate was about 7%. Since then, over time, we were able to get our updated uh, unfunded liability as of June 30th, 2021. That dropped it to $54.1 million, which is good. And that's primarily driven one by the discount rate, CalPERS reduced to 6.8%, and then also CalPERS returned 21%, which was higher than the 7% that they expected. So wow. that's actually really kind of good news. It reduced our funding. So as part of it in the January board, I came in and asked, we want to sell up to, but no more than $55 million in bonds. The bonds would be 15 years. 
And we projected we'd save about $16 million going down this route of selling bonds versus keeping it in CalPERS. So as a result, we went out this past Wednesday, uh, February 16th, and from 6 a.m. our time to 10 a.m. our time, they went out and they basically put out the order. This doesn't mean you sell them, we do the order. And based on that, we had 4.6 um, oversubscribed. So that means we had 4.6 times the amount of orders for our bonds than what we, um, we were going to actually sell, which is actually great news. One, we priced it very well. We didn't overprice it so that we get a tenfold, but we didn't underprice it either, either in the fact that we got people back. And as you can see in the chart here, primarily people were looking at more of the short term. That's why it was, you know, 7.5%, nine times nine people or nine companies effectively wanted our full amount of bonds, which is this dark bottom down here. So as you can see, it's fairly well distributed. Everybody wanted to go in and, and, and buy our bonds, which is actually really good news. So as part of that, we ended up selling our bonds and here are the, our investors in our bonds. And as you can see, as you go across, it, it ranges everywhere from, you know, the big name Allstate to a lot of different investment firms. You have Wells Capital Management, you got RBC, JP Morgan Asset Management. So this is actually really kind of good news. And on the chart on the right over here on our investors, we sold $51,750,000 worth of bonds. Everything in blue are investors from that are based in New York, uh, based in the state of California. So Wells Capital, which being the largest, uh, almost four point six million dollars is invested in it. So uh, we got a definitely a diverse group, and as part of it, here's our results. So as our results, as you can see, the the blue box right here is going to be our new payment stream. The yellow dotted line would have been our payment stream going forward. And as a result, down here at the very bottom is we're going to save $17.1 million over the course. And our total all-in cost is 3.33%. I can tell you right now, with the interest rates, we are on the upswing because of what you, you see that the interest rates of the Fed has been talking about. We're going to do multiple up, upticks of interest. They've increased it. Now they're even forecasting a half a percent raise instead of a quarter percent raise. And, you know, I would say it would have been much better two weeks ago than doing it when we did. But I'm going to tell you we're better off when we did now because in two weeks it's going to be even higher. So we did kind of get the uptick. So it is much, much higher than what you might have seen around some of the counties and cities, what they got maybe months and months ago, but we're still on the low end. And I think we did really good. And like I said, we're going to save $17 million minimum um, going forward. So as part of this, um, this leads me into the request, uh, the, uh, the request so the request, and you can see it up here in the very top line, uh, which I'm kind of circling right here, it's 3.414274 and, and debt service. We've moved so fast through this process that uh, the way the structure works, our major G revenue will actually be intercepted by a bank. The bank will take off are in our part of our bond payment and which includes our interest and principal and then gives us the rest of the money. The problem is that won't be in place for another couple of months. And as part of the process, we actually have to pre-fund, I'll just say our first six month interest and principal payments, which take place in August. So effectively, what I'm asking for is that we can put $3.4 million into this pot and we will actually recoup that $3.4 million over the next six months. Effectively, uh, when the intercept goes in, this is where, they, where the bank intercepts our money and then takes the money off, they won't take any money off. So they'll give us all the money through. So we won't actually have that residual until after August. So I know it's kind of a little math exercise, but I'm asking to pre-fund it with money now that will recoup one sixth of it over the next six months 
and effectively it'll come right back to us. It's just because I don't have the intercept in place at this point because we've gone through so fast through this process. Very good, Chuck. Any uh, questions, comments from the board? This is an interesting piece of information and it looks very good. Put my hand up, Larry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I see uh, Manu. Oh, Director uh, Kulik, or, or Director Rockin was. It's all right, Manu, go ahead, I'll follow you. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, this is fantastic news. Um, great to see so much demand for our bonds. And as you said, uh, you know, 3.3 .3 is not, not the, the best that we've seen out there, but um, still, I think it's a, a fantastic rate given the change, rapidly changing environment. Um, so if I'm reading this correctly, it looks like um, this will save us um, maybe a little over a million dollars in the, in the very short term. Um, I just was, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more. I mean, I know that in some when we adopted uh, this year's budget, and I'm sure we'll discuss it again as we look at next year's budget, um, but that we are still looking at a, a structural deficit. Um, I believe it was expected to grow to about three three $3.8 million um, by 2026. So just to make sure I understand, this is definitely a piece that helps with that, uh, but doesn't solve it. Is, is that a fair understanding? Yeah, so that you, you're dead on, yes. This is one piece of multiple pieces that have to take place in order to kind of solve that structural deficit. But this is one item that will help dramatically um, as we kind of move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, all the hard work. Thanks. Director Rotkin. Yes, um, I wanna thank you, Chuck, uh, for bringing this to us. Also our former chair, Donald Lind, who pressed hard for this over a number of months, if not years. Um, it really makes a difference. And without your expertise and um, explanations of this to those of us that are not financial wizards, um, it, it probably wouldn't have happened. So I really, I, it needs to be really strongly underscored that you've made a real difference in a short time you've been with the district here in terms of saving us literally millions of dollars. And it's really fantastic. Um, I'm gonna wait till we hear from the public, but I'm certainly prepared to make the motion to uh, for, uh, for pre-funding the principal and interest as been suggested by Chuck Farmer. Thank you. Director McPherson. Yeah, I just want to repeat, congratulations to this board and to the administration for putting this forward and uh, for Chuck Farmer, you know, just spearheading it and seeing it through. This is fantastic news. As uh, Director Con um, uh, Koenig said, it's not going to solve our deficit problem, but uh, it sure does a, a good job of getting us back on closer to the right track. So. Thank you to everybody, uh, very forward looking and it's great that we took this action. Director Parker. Um, I wanna congratulate you too, because I've been looking at this for over a year, not just with Metro, but with the city of Watsonville. I know the county has done it and uh, if more people understood, they would have, of course, like you said, with the rates come in a little bit earlier, but you came in just in time because everything is just going up pretty crazily. So congratulations on that. And uh, I look forward to uh, approving this motion. Any other comments from directors? Uh, seeing none, I go to the public. Uh, any comments from our viewers? I see no hands. Um, well, I'll move approval of the recommended staff action on this item, which is to pre-fund the first principal and interest payments in the bond due August 1st, uh, 2022. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are we ready for a vote, please? Uh, Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Is he not here? Jimmy, you're muted. We're on a bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll come back to you. <laughs> uh, Director Tom Perry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pagler. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And I didn't see uh, Jimmy return. Uh, yeah. So we'll just uh, put him as absent. Uh, the motion passes. Very good. 
Great work, Chuck. I appreciate your efforts on this and to Donna for moving this forward. This has been a good effort. Thanks. And I can't stop sharing, so somebody needs to kick me out. <laughs> okay. The menu won't come up. <laughs> Someone know how to do that? I'm working on it. Okay. Thank you, Donna. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. We're on to the interim CEO oral report from Don. Would like to care? Take this on, please. We still have a screen sharing coming from Community TV, I think. Hmm. I don't think so. Uh -oh. hmm. Somebody's sharing. Okay, let's see here. Hmm. It says you are viewing C, uh, CTV screen. So yeah. Think... Nope. That's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Is so, that? Uh, there we go. There, there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. That's got it. Okay. Ah, uh, you all. I can see you all again. <laughs> all right. Well, good morning, everyone. Don Prime. Um, I would like to share um some good positive news with you. Um, we missed a couple of new hires last month when we announced um, new hires and promotions. So I would like to honor them now. Um, our three bus operators that started at the end of December are Vincent Garcia, Roberta Rodriguez, Edgar Garcia Ramos. Um, they So like I said, they all started end of December. Um, starting next Monday, the 28th, they will um, start their line instruction, um, which if you're not familiar with that, they're on the bus and they're doing things, but they're being supervised by a current bus operator. Um, and so once they pass that, they'll be out on their own and we'll have three new operators out there um, for us, so that's very exciting. Um, in the month of February, we also had a paratransit operator start with us, and um, the name is Ramiro Arupeza. I probably butchered that last name, and I really do apologize. Um, we also, for promotions, we had a um, promotion in our paratransit um, division as well, and uh, her name is Veronica Hoover, and um, she was promoted to dispatch scheduler from driver, so that's exciting. Um, and then we had two, um, two employees promote into our management team. So we're excited about that. We were able to um, promote Freddie Martinez, and he's our new revenue account manager. You're here. Yes. yes. And we were also able to promote um, Joan Jeffries, and Joan That's is our new purchasing great. manager. You're here as so, well. Congratulations. Yeah, very, very exciting news. That's great. Yes. Um, to the not so exciting news, but getting better news, we'll talk about COVID. Um, so when I reported to you last month, I gave you a really high number that had um, with our, of our positives from uh, January 1st. Um, since my last report, we've had 14 new um, cases. However, only one case in the last 14 days. So that goes along with what I explained last month where you know we hit that really high peak, due, you know, with the holidays and the fact that Omicron is so contagious, and now we've come down. So only one in the last 14 days, which is awesome. Now, due to as many um, positive cases that we had in our in our operations um, division, um, we ended up hitting what's called a major outbreak. And where I fail with information, Curtis will jump in and help me here. Um, but if you have 20 positives in a 30-day period, you, you hit what's called major outbreak. So there's some things that need to happen with that. We went to uh, twice a week testing, mandatory testing for everyone. So regardless of vaccinated or unvaccinated, everybody had to test twice a week. Everybody had to mask up, even in areas where you don't have to wear a mask. And even now with no mask uh, mandate in Santa Cruz County, if you're in operations, you still need to wear a mask because of the ma major outbreak. Um, so it, it sparked an OSHA audit. So an OSHA auditor came in, checked our facilities. So things they looked at were cleaning, you know, uh, our cleaning stations, um, how things were set up, how an operator comes in, receives their, their pack and goes to their bus and just basically watched the whole process. Um, our safety director, Curtis, walked with them the whole time, answered questions, 
Um, we also shared our contact tracing forum. So each time somebody tests positive, you know that we contact them right away. We do a, a contact tracing. We share that with the public health department. And then we also turned that information over to OSHA to make sure that we're covering all of our bases. Um, from what I understand, it could take up to three to six months um, for us to get a final report back. But I did the exit um, review with Curtis along with the auditor and they shared with us that nothing stood out um, that, that, that caused concern. And they were very happy with, with you know, all of our policies and, and our procedures that were in place. Um, Curtis, if I left anything out, let me know. Did I? No, nope, that's good. That's, that's accurate. All right, perfect. So, um, you know, the way I feel about an audit is it's not, a, not always a bad thing. I feel like it's not something where, you know, you're worried about, oh my gosh, we have an audit. I feel like an audit is, is a help, you know, is help because we need to know if we're failing in any, in any area. And so you really don't know that unless you get audited. So um, hopefully it comes back flying colors though. I'd like to believe that we are not failing in any, any area, but um, I wasn't upset at, at the fact that we got audited. I think it's a good thing. Um, that is all I have to share with you today, unless you have questions for me. That's good news. I appreciate your, uh... You're taking care of that, both Curtis and you. Very yeah. good. Um, Director McPherson. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Don for an excellent job and interim CEO. Uh, there's been some, the uh, OSHA audit is something you probably didn't need to have on your plate at this mm -hmm. time, but uh, you've done a fantastic job. And, uh, and the whole uh, administrative team, uh, thank you very much. It's been really outstanding and uh, you're to be really applauded for your great work that you've done in this interim. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That really means a lot to me. And I honestly 100% could not do it without my, without everyone of the whole admin staff, you know, um, Margo, I think calls me daily and says, do you need anything? Can I help you with anything? And, or something's going on. She's, you know, she'll always close the call with, let me know if you need anything. Um, Curtis, Chuck, everybody, like my assistant, Monique, I mean, if I didn't have her, there's absolutely no way I could do this. So, um, and Donna Bauer has been amazing. Just everybody, you know, I, there's no way I could do it without everybody. So much thanks to everybody out there. Uh, Director Lynn. And I just wanted to add my thanks as well. You just, you know, you've risen above even what we'd hoped. So uh, excellent job stepping in and, and, you know, challenging times. And you've just really, really uh, made us all proud. Thank you. Thank you very much. It means a lot. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Very good work. Here, here. Any other comments? All right. Uh, let's move on to um, our state legislative update. Are we able to? Walter, are you able to pull up slide 52? Um, can, I, can I speak really fast? Um, sure, Don, go ahead. I want to make sure that we have Josh's uh, current slides. Um, I think he sent something after, and I think what he's seeing in the packet may not be the current, and he can share his screen with the current okay. if that um, would help. Don, if you want to have us check real quick, we could look at our fifth slide. Sorry, board members, but we found it. Michael and I found a couple of typos. If you go a couple more down, we can check real quick. That's fine. A uh, couple more down. It's going to be like slide 56, and I can check a date just to tell you. Is that, yeah, 56. If you click on that so we can yeah, see it, please. Like 56. This. We're just checking the date on slide 56. Go down one more, please, to 56. Yep. yep. There we go. All right. Actually, I think you've got the uh, correct version. Is that right, Michael? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take it away if you'd like. Thanks, Chair Pegler and uh, board members. I'm Josh Shaw with Shaw Yoder and Antwish Milton Line. If we could have uh, CTV go up to the beginning of our slides, appreciate that. I'm here, yeah, well, how about we start on slide 52, probably. Yeah. Yeah, go, go to 53, hey, why not, 53, <laughs> uh, there we go. Hi, I'm Josh Shaw with Shaw Yoder and Tui Schmelzer and Lang. I'm here with my colleague, Michael Pimentel. Michael co-leads with me your state advocacy efforts. So we're in the state capital in Sacramento, California. This morning, we're gonna talk about some key legislation we've seen introduced this year already in the 2022 legislative session. We'll talk about some transit funding opportunities as well that should be exciting for Metro, possibly some challenges. Next slide, please. 
Folks, you'll recall the California legislature operates in a two-year cycle. We call that a biennium. We last saw you, I think, in late October of last year to de debrief on the results of the first year, the 2021 half of the 21-22 biennium. Next slide, please. So we're now 56 days into the second year of the two-year legislative session. In fact, a week ago today, last Friday, was the deadline for legislators to introduce, meaning put into print for the public to see, any bills they want to try to move to the governor uh, before the August 31st deadline. That's the, the, at midnight on the 31st will be the last night of this year's uh, session. So that, you know, they get the bills to the governor by then, or they're done and would have to come back into a new session next year. So we've combed through since last Friday, more than 2000 bills introduced this year. And while about 640 of those are still just technical, non-substantive bills, we call spot bills, which can serve as a vehicle for legislators who haven't quite decided yet what they want to do with their entire bill package, but they had to have a vehicle in public print. So notwithstanding those 640 or so of those spot bills, we have looked at more than uh, 1,400 substantive bills, and we have seen several bills already that we think should be of interest to you and Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. So Michael Pimentel is actually gonna move through uh, three or four bills that he wants to call to your attention. So next slide, please, Michael. Well, thank you, Josh and directors. Good to be with you this morning. This is Josh Nerona, Michael Pimentel with Shaw Yorant, we Schmelzer and Lang. And the legislative session has just begun, uh, but already as Josh uh, had mentioned, we have seen some significant legislative action already. Uh, one of the first emergency actions that the legislature took uh, this year upon their return to Sacramento uh, was to reestablish COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. Uh, now the requirement which applies to all employers with more than 25 employees entitles those employees to up to 80 hours of COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. Uh, there are two buckets of, uh, of hours that comprise that 80 hours, uh, 40 hours for uh, certain specified uh, conditions uh, largely related to um, after effects from the COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, or instances where folks are going in for a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, the second 40 hours would be made available to uh, individuals who uh, happen to become a COVID positive case. Uh, now the requirements are retroactive to January 1, 2022, and there are uh, retroactive requirements that the agencies uh, or employers rather uh, provide um, payment to uh, employees who may have qualified uh, for the supplemental paid sick leave earlier this year, uh, though the bill, of course, uh, just recently went into effect. Uh, and it will remain in effect as a body of law through September 30th, 2022. Uh, and so let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Now, among the other new bills that have been introduced this year that would provide benefit to Metro is SB 922. Uh, now, this bill would permanently extend and expand CEQA exemptions for certain transit projects, including certain project types that are key priorities for the district, like zero emission uh, bus charging and refueling infrastructure. Uh, now, we understand that in the near term, the district will be bringing on a permanent CEO, uh, and we intend to discuss with them the potential for Metro to support this bill, uh, given that it aligns so well with overall priorities that you have uh, as an agency. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, now, another key bill is AB 2622, which would extend the sales and use tax exemption for zero emission buses purchased by transit agencies through 2034. Uh, now, we estimate that this bill would save Metro between $30,000 and $50,000 per zero emission bus purchase. Obviously you are on a path to 100% zero emission bus fleets uh, in a manner consistent with uh, the California Resources Board's innovative clean transit regulation and over the life uh, of your transition, uh, this may uh, save you uh, several millions of dollars. Uh, and it's with that, uh, that we will be discussing uh, with the permanent CEO, the potential for Metro to support this bill. Uh, so let's move to the next slide. Now, you may recall that in early 2020, prior to the pandemic, we had brought to you three bills that would have required transit agencies, including Metro, to provide fare-free transit to various populations as a condition 
for receiving state funding. Uh, now, those bills would have challenged Metro's budget and undermined, among other things, your agreement for student passes with Carrillo College. Uh, and it's with that as context that Metro had opposed those bills. Now, ultimately, the bills were tabled because of the pandemic. Many legislative vehicles were um, repurposed for other uses that were pandemic focused. Uh, but now that the pandemic uh, has begun to subside and the public health conditions have improved, legislators are once again revisiting the concept of fare free transit, albeit in different ways. Now, SB 878, which is the first uh, bill that is noted for you in that yellow box by Senator Nancy Skinner from Oakland focuses on free transportation for K through 12 students. Now, notably, it doesn't place the burden on transit agencies to provide uh, this free transportation, but rather it charges school districts to, with making arrangements to provide free school transportation that would be backed uh, by new funding. Uh, now, part of the way that school districts may be able to provide this service would be through contract with transit agencies, and that is allowed for in the bill. Uh, now, there is one other bill that wades into this space, and that would be AB 1919 by Assembly Member Chris Holden from Pasadena, uh, which is potentially similar to the 2020 uh, measures, uh, though at this point, it's what we call in Sacramento an intent bill. It simply states at this point in time that the intent of the legislature to enact legislation uh, to provide fare free transit. Uh, however, the parameters of uh, those requirements are not yet in print. And there's something that we're going to be tracking over the coming weeks and months uh, and then be reporting back to you, uh, particularly if we see challenges uh, for the district uh, and your budgets. And so at this time, I'll hand it back to Josh uh, to run us through uh, some of the high level takeaways uh, from the state budget that was introduced in January. Can we ask some questions about uh, these bills? Go right ahead, Mike. So for Skinner, SB8, that seems to me a very positive thing. Uh, you know, if we can get young people, or K-12 students, free bus rides, and they start to learn how to ride the bus as part of their regular routines in life, they may become lifelong transit riders. And I think that's critical, not just for our district, but, you know, for the for the uh, work planet as a whole in terms of getting people out of auto, private automobiles and onto public transit. But right now, Skinner's basically saying the legislature will pay this cost. It wouldn't be, unlike the bills last year, wouldn't, wouldn't fall in the districts to provide the service for free. What risk do we face that, um, you know, this switches, you know, legislature thinks great idea and stuff, and then in some committee it gets amended to say, yeah, let's do this, but let's make the transit districts pay for it. And to what extent, I mean, should we be tracking this bill as opposed to, I mean, it's, it's something I would support it now in its current form. Um, <clears throat> but the question is, I'm, I'm asking about the details of how lobbying works and how our support, um, operates, what, what should our position be about a bill like this that looks very promising, but has, I, I would assume, some risk, at least, that it might turn bad for us? I would say that at this stage, because the bill hasn't seen so much as its first policy committee, it makes good sense to just continue to watch the bill. And certainly as it moves through the budget, uh, through the legislative process, we'd want to uh, continue to track to see if there are any substantive amendments that are taken to the bill. Uh, there are a few things that I think would support the bill moving forward in its current form. Uh, one is that uh, the bill does make a commitment to identifying funding, uh, and Senator Skinner does have the advantage of serving as a Senate budget chair, uh, which yeah. means that she is in a prime position for helping to secure funding to actually bring uh, the bill uh, in, uh, in, in place in its current form. And, and then secondly, um, Oakland uh, Unified School District uh, is uh, a school district in, in the state that partners uh, very well with AC Transit and actually provides uh, direct funding support to uh, that district. I think she would be very uh, cognizant of not wanting to disrupt uh, that type of relationship between her school district and her bus agency uh, by creating new requirements on uh, the transit agencies uh, that may undermine their ability to get funding uh, from the school district. And so I think there are a number of factors that will uh, manifest within these conversations that would uh, lead us to a, a positive outcome uh, on this front. Uh, but again, on, on this, um, at this early stage, we'd recommend just watching the bill and as it moves through the various uh, transportation committees, uh, possibly the education committee, uh, we'll wanna see if there are any significant amendments that are taken uh, that may create new challenges for uh, school districts and transit agencies across the state. So, so my my view is, you know, again, if this goes in a positive way and the legislature does agree that they're willing to fund this, 
to me, this is really critical. I and mean, it's a could really, really make a difference to you know, California in general and to the planet as a whole. And so I guess I'd like us to be informed about, you know, the earliest opportunity if it continues to be a positive bill for us to jump in and do some serious lobbying around this issue because I think it could really make a difference. So I guess that's just, you know, I think I'll take your advice. We should be following the bill or you know, studying where it goes, but at, at some point, please, I think the direction from us ought to be, please get back to us when it looks like it really is happening and we could be helpful. Absolutely. We're committed to continue to monitor this bill and we'll certainly raise with the, the new CEO uh, the potential for, for uh, support or position on this bill. And we'll be bringing it back uh, to you all as a board. I mean, we, even, even, even to the extent that we go out to our local cities and the county and look for you know, resolutions of support from them as well. So we really put some everything we can possibly do to support it if it continues to move in a positive direction. And I might uh, ask for a brief elaboration on intent language only. Uh, how does that apply? And I'm sure uh, Directors Henderson and Northcutt will be of in interest in this issue, representing UCSC and Cabrillo College. Good thing. So with intent language, uh, it is generally introduced by a legislator when they're still working on a concept. And they may be working with a sponsor to really understand the parameters of what they intend to move forward with. And so they'll introduce what they call intent language that just directionally sets where they are going, uh, but there will be uh, more specifics that are provided in future weeks and months uh, through an amendment to uh, the bill. Uh, we would anticipate that probably within the next month, we'll see the true parameters of the bill, uh, meaning that the requirements, whether it's uh, a mandate without funding or uh, a new program that provides funding and it's an elective uh, pursuit, all of that will be sketched out uh, in the coming weeks and months as we see new language introduced. Thank you, Mike. Sorry, I interrupted. You're on your way back to Josh. Josh, we'll hand it back to you. Yeah, if we could have the next slide, please. And I'm going to talk about the budget and funding. And of course, if Senator Skinner and others find the solution to the question that Director Rockin raised about that fair free transit bill in terms of providing funding to the educational uh, to the to the to the school districts and or transit we will of course report back in any case so let's talk real quick about the state budget uh, on January 10th Governor Newsom released his proposed state budget for 22-23 lots of good news for public transit uh, but the legislature of course has to now craft their response the governor governor's proposed legislatures actually uh, legislate and send the budget to back to the governor so they may take some of his ideas they may reject some of his ideas they'll certainly add some of their own ideas and a budget is owed back to the governor for signature in the law by june 15th so we've got a few months to figure these things out and what we'd like to do similar to the interaction chair pegler and uh, director rockin just had with michael on bringing back legislative priorities relative to your expressed funding priorities this is an information item today but we'll work with don and then the handoff to your new ceo and and come back to help work with you and your agency to shape the message you want us to deliver to the legislature relative to your budget priorities so, but having said that, on the screen right now, you can see what the governor has proposed that could be of a, a real interest to public transit. You, just to set the stage, though, for these proposals this year, you may recall that last May, with the April tax receipts then in hand, the governor made a supplemental budget proposal to the legislature, recognizing the state's revenues were then coming in much higher than projected. He proposed several billion dollars in new general, general fund spending across a variety of programs. In our world, he made some transportation spending proposals, including, for instance, on new public transit capital spending, zero emission vehicles, et cetera. Now, that whole aspect of his budget proposal for the most part did not get enacted in the current year 21-22 budget although there are some zero emission dollars that got in there we'll come back to that these larger billion dollar multi-billion dollar transit spending proposals didn't get done so in Jan on january 10th of this year he basically doubled down on that proposal but also plussed it up because again state revenues are materializing in the middle of the 21-22 budget, much higher than originally projected. In fact, there could be a multi tens of billions of dollars 
uh, surplus projected at June 30, 2022, leading into the upcoming year's budget. So you can see here billions of dollars in new transportation spending, including $3.25 billion in transit capital. He would propose to uh, run that through a program with which we're very familiar that rewards agencies who are moving to the zero emission and cleaner transit uh, operations. That's a billion dollars more than he proposed last year. You can see some of the other pots of money, including a lot of money no, uh, north of $2 billion for zero emission buses and other heavy duty equipment like that. The key will be, frankly, can the legislature resolve with the governor his ask for the final $4.2 billion in high speed rail Prop 1A bond funding approved by the voters in California in 2010, but still not fully appropriated by the legislature. There are various legislators who care about how that money would be spent uh, on the whole planned high-speed rail system. The governor wants to have a package deal. Uh, you know, I'll give you transit funding if we, in fact, can find a way to fund the high-speed rail system. So those uh, conversations, which could be thorny, will continue, but we'll want to figure out your voice and your specific key message points in those budget discussions. Now, Michael is going to give you a little bit more on some of the specific transit funding programs that pop out of the governor's January 10th budget proposal. So if we could see the next slide. Thank you, Josh. Um, board members, I do want to highlight for you, uh, the governor has put forward again, a really robust uh, package of investments in zero emission uh, vehicles and zero emission infrastructure. Uh, the budget includes $6.1 billion in new funding uh, for zero emission vehicles and infrastructure. And combined with the $3.9 billion that was approved last year, that is a $10 billion uh, investment package over these past two fiscal years. Uh, now, of the $6.1 billion that is on the table uh, this year, $460 million is specifically earmarked for zero emission transit buses and related infrastructure. Uh, those are monies that are exclusive to transit agencies to ultimately support with compliance with the California Resources Board's Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. Uh, now, the proposed investments are multi-year in nature. They're, support, they're intended to support the deployment of 1,700 zero emission transit buses in the state through fiscal year 24-25. Uh, of that $6.1 billion total, there is an additional $1.1 billion for uh, what is defined as zero emission trucks, buses, and off-road vehicles and related infrastructure. Those monies ultimately pass through the California Resources Board and the California Energy Commission. Uh, there's always a sub-allocation process associated with that. A portion of those dollars will ultimately come uh, to transit agencies. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, we don't yet know uh, the level of additional funding uh, that will be provided uh, to agencies as part of that $1.1 billion uh, line item. I do also want to highlight uh, uh, an amount uh, of $383 million for zero emission transportation. Uh, now, as contemplated, uh, this program is largely going to advantage the transition to zero emission rail technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, but the state does recognize that as part of the rail uh, network in the state of California, there is a robust network of commuter buses that help create linkages uh, to those uh, rail lines. Uh, and with that, there will be new monies that will flow from that $383 million for the electrification of over-the-road coaches operated by public agencies. Uh, very familiar with the fact that Santa Cruz Metro operates an over-the-road over coach on State Route 1. Uh, that is going to be an opportunity uh, for uh, Santa Cruz Metro to ultimately secure some monies from those programs. Uh, now, you will see that there are green cells that are uh, included within uh, this slide. These are uh, all the funding programs that we see uh, as being either directly advantageous to public transit agencies or for which public transit agencies uh, will be eligible. And so we'll be coming back to you, as Josh noted, uh, as the budget process continues to unfold uh, to better inform you on how uh, the process uh, is developing, whether or not we're actually going to see these dollars uh, flow as part of the fiscal year 2022 to 2023 budget. Uh, and that will uh, be something that we'll come back to you uh, for after the introduction of what the governor calls his May revise, which is a mid-year update uh, to his proposed budget. And so we'll move to the next slide where I do want to provide you with just a high-level overview 
of the status of ongoing transit funding. We just spent a few minutes talking about the new funding that was proposed, largely discretionary. Uh, these are monies that are going to flow irrespective of whether or not the legislature, the, the Newsom administration come to an agreement on high-speed rail and the larger transportation funding package. And with this, there's a lot of good news. The state transit assistance program, which serves as the lifeblood of public transit in the state, is projected to be up more than $15 million in fiscal year 22-23 over the current fiscal year of 21-22. Uh, and this brings us to a historically high $854 million for this program. Additionally, the local transportation fund uh, is projected to be up $87 million in fiscal year 22-23 over the current fiscal year. Uh, and that brings us to over $2.1 uh, uh, billion in funds for that program. Uh, now, you'll see here that the Transit and City Rail Capital Program, or TIRCP, shows a decline in funding. I'll just note that such a declines are fairly typical uh, to be presented in the January budget, and, and that is because the administration takes a very conservative approach to the projections of funds for this program as to not influence the market for cap-and-trade auction proceeds uh, that serve as a basis of funding for this program. And I'll hand it back to Josh, and together we'll take questions on the balance of this presentation. Thanks, Michael. Board members, that's our presentation. Just as a reminder, and again, this is an early look at key legislative and funding priorities that will play out for the rest of the year, and we're happy to work with you and your staff to shape up specific action items and or advocacy messages as you see fit. At this point, we'll take questions or bow out if you're done with us. Very good information. Thank you very much for this, Josh and Michael. I see uh, Director McPherson has comment. Yes, um, as you know, I think, uh, thank you, Josh and Mike, for the uh, presentation. Uh, appreciate it very much. As you know, that uh, Santa Cruz County and its uh, four cities are part of Central Coast Community Energy that has many incentive programs itself for zero emission vehicles. Uh, with, could that fact uh, help in our application for some of these funds, or do you have any idea? Can, can there, there be a nexus there of some type that uh, we're forward looking? We're, uh, well, we have 35 governing agencies in this program, Triple uh, CE at this point. Can that help, or could it help in any way? Director McPherson, I assume that there are at least two, three, I can think of four grant programs that would be funded by, uh, supplemented by the proposals that we showed you that the governor made. Um, and if the legislature sends that back to the governor with those plussed up dollars that very well could advantage you based on your CCA uh, connections there in the county. And, I, and we would be happy to work with uh, John and Wanda Moo and other folks on your staff who handle those grants to, to make sure we're highlighting that aspect in the right way when you make the applications later this year. Good, and thank you for your, uh, your, uh, your energy and uh, getting uh, our, our uh, programs up on the front of the line there. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Director Henderson. Larry, um, so just to go back a little bit to 1919, uh, well, Assembly Bill 1919, not the year 1919. Um, you, you indicated that we would start to see additional information as it came forth. Is there any place that I can find information as it is now other than the, uh, the public website for um, State of California, which I've already gone to and it gives me a little bit of information? Uh, or some sort of rough timeline on when we can start to see additional information. Um, something like this, uh, while it sounds wonderful to relieve students of, of cost burdens like this, uh, could have some unintended consequences, as I think we can all imagine. Uh, so I, I'm, this does, you know, like Larry uh, indicated, um, does raise a little bit of a red flag for us. At this stage, the information that is available is that which is available on the state of California's Ledge Info website. Uh, we can certainly reach out to the author's office and see if there's perhaps a pre-draft uh, document that they may be able to share it with us, but anticipate that they'll be keeping uh, that language close to their chest uh, before introduction. Uh, but uh, with regards to your question on timeline, uh, the soonest that we'll, we'll see um, a uh, bill being am amended is within 30 days of introduction. That means we've got uh, something like an additional two to three weeks uh, before we uh, have uh, the eligibility for that bill to be uh, amended and in print, uh, potentially heard for a hearing. 
And so um, we'll be able to report back to you. We'll, we'll uh, reach out to uh, CEO uh, Creme and, and provide her that information uh, as soon as we see it in print. Uh, make sure that, that you all have visibility into whatever is introduced as soon as it is. And if I might, Director Henderson, uh, kind of underscoring a point that Michael made in his exchange with Director Rockin on the Skinner Bill and under the same topic, we know going back two years that your board is concerned about the impact of these kinds of bills. And we're not going to just watch them. Michael Pimentel's talking to Senator Skinner's office, talking to Assemblymember Holden's office constantly to try to figure out exactly where they do want to go with these bills. Because as you said, it could be really great for transit. But if we're left holding the bag, that's going to be difficult. So we're pushing to find out about these bills, not just kind of passively watching to see what happens to them. Yeah, and if, and if you need any sort of assistance, anecdotal or otherwise, to help support or at least try to get a, um, you know, these potential gotchas in front of the folks who are pushing this, um, just so they understand the, I'm sure you guys are on top of it, but um, I just want to make sure that we're checking our boxes and doing our due diligence uh, so that a good deed potentially doesn't um, blow up in our collective faces. Got it. Thank you for the offer. And Dan, I'm sure that the other colleges and universities in the Bay Area that uh, you stay in touch with will have a similar interest, and uh, you'll probably like to involve government relations from UC. Yeah, the email is being drafted as it's Very good. All right. Any other questions, Mike? I see your hand. Yeah, it's not a question. I just want to uh, thank both Josh and Michael for their work. And we made a good decision when we selected you to represent us in Sacramento because uh, it really th th this comes to the bottom line for us in so many different cases. And really appreciate the work you do for us. You've been doing a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Rock and Chair Pegler. Thank you and all your board colleagues and the Metro staff. We really love working with you and uh, we will keep you up to speed and come back and ask you for additional direction as needed throughout this legislative year. Thank you, Josh. We appreciate it and uh, look forward to your next visit. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a federal legislative update. Um, let's see, is that with Chris? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Chair Pegler, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mayor Lynn, thank you for your leadership uh, as well. Uh, Chris Giglio here from uh, from Washington, D.C. to uh, uh, give a federal update. And um, if you if you recall, since the pandemic started, I, uh, I believe I'm contractually required to tell you how poor the weather is here and that <laughs> I really need to be out there. Uh, so this morning when I walked my dog, it was 35 degrees of gray. So well. Trust that it's cold out here as well. Uh, I can see Larry's uh, all I'm freezing. up, but uh, <laughs> that means it's like 70, right? <laughs> oh, it was about 32. Okay. <laughs> but it, it does warm up during the day. I'll it does. It does. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm looking forward to the time when I can. As it was actually exactly two years ago, uh, the last time I was out there uh, for the February Metro Board meeting. So, uh, and then everything happened. Anywho, uh, I uh, I do have some slides uh, that I uh, that if you could kind of put them up there with regard to uh, a, a federal uh, update uh, since we last spoke. Uh, I believe we spoke in October uh, last, and, and so that was right before uh, Congress uh, approved and the president signed into law uh, a big infrastructure bill. And so I, so I think while you probably know a lot about it, I might go over a little bit of that uh, as well. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, here's the three things that I was going to talk about. The, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, uh, that's the infrastructure bill. Build Back Better is the president's uh, sort of second uh, infrastructure bill that's still pending, a human infrastructure bill, a social infrastructure bill, a lot of people call it. And then, of course, we'll talk about the FY 2022 Department of Transportation budget, which, uh, which impacts us. So next slide, please. So I don't, you know, I find this funny uh, and it's weird, but you know, Congress, you know, approved this bill in November, signed it into law, and they gave it an official name, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And so when it when, right after it passed, we all started calling it the IIJA. Well, the White House really insists on calling it the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, BIL. So you probably see those two terms interchangeable. Uh, clearly, it makes sense uh, that the White House would want to call it this. 
Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't ask Congress to, you know, make that the official name, but those are two inter, uh, interchangeable terms. So as you can see here, it passed the Senate in August of last year uh, with the support of 19 Republicans. And that's where the bipartisan came from. Uh, the, it was that it was a group of about um, 20 uh, U.S. senators, uh, about 10 Republicans, 10 Democrats, who came up with this with this bill, passed the House in November with 13 Republicans. That's not a lot. That's a that's a lot. Uh, you know, out of 435 members of the House, uh, it's it wasn't exactly a bipartisan vote in the House, but 13 Republicans did vote for it. And then the the president quickly signed it into law. Uh, in November, and since then has been working really hard to implement this. So the bill totals about $1.2 trillion. That's what you hear. It's a $1.2 trillion kind of generational investment in what we would call traditional infrastructure, transportation, bridges, roads, transit, um, uh, water, uh, water infrastructure, cybersecurity, uh, things like that, uh, broadband uh, infrastructure about uh, what I call new money in that in that of that 1.2 trillion is about 550 billion and, and by new money I mean money that Congress was not going to allocate for programs if we if we didn't have this infrastructure bill there were there were things uh, in both the transportation and water areas that Congress was likely to do and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment uh, even even if we didn't finish this infrastructure bill so of about 550 bill, million in new money, a billion in new money. About half of that goes to the Department of Transportation, and about 21 billion out of it or so uh, goes directly to the Federal Transit Administration. The largest investment there, for our purposes, is about five billion dollars over five years for what they call the Low No Program, Low and No Emissions Grant Program. And as you might imagine, it's used. It's a competitive program. Uh, that is used to purchase uh, infrastructure and uh, low emissions uh, uh, low emissions buses and the infrastructure associated with it. Uh, it's five billion dollars over five years, so it's a little over a billion dollars, uh, about a billion dollars a year for the next five years. Uh, it's a competitive grant program that previously received somewhere in the, along the lines of $150 million from Congress over the last few years. So as you can tell, it's a huge increase coming at a really good time for us, of course, as we, uh, you know, sort of move to uh, fully uh, electrify uh, our fleet. Um, and then, like I said, the, the, so the Department of Transportation having half of this new money has been very busy uh, sort of implementing this, uh, this program. They're trying to get as many programs out as they can uh, and quickly. Uh, I will say that, you know, one, especially, you know, the elected officials here on, on, the, on the board, um, you know, sort of the first question that comes up when you see this generational federal investment, this big infrastructure bill, what's in it for me, right? What's in it for my community? And it's hard to tell. Uh, it's uh, six, approximately 60% of the funding uh, through this uh, infrastructure bill is in the form of block grants to states. Uh, and so the states have the authority. They're, they're getting formula funding based on population or poverty or different things, uh, depending on the program. Uh, and then they, you know, have the ability to pass that down. Uh, another 28% of it, I, I guess, maybe let's, let's call it 30% of it, is through competitive grant programs, some of which uh, a transit agency or a local government would be eligible for, uh, others not. And so uh, when you're talking about, you know, back when we had the uh, uh, American Rescue Plan, the pandemic relief bill, you could kind of see what you were going to get. There was lots of formula funding for transit and for local governments. You could see what you were getting. Uh, this is a little more difficult. There's going to be competitive programs. There's going to be dealing with the state, uh, trying to get money passed down. Um, but as I said, uh, the Department of Transportation is really ramping up and trying to get that money out. I will say, for instance, uh, in, in recent months, they've released, 20, uh, they released um, $7 billion, I believe, in bridge money uh, to states. They've also released a, a $1.5 billion dollar uh, competitive grant program called the RAISE program in the past. You guys might have heard of it called the TIGER program, the BUILD program. It's a very competitive discretionary grant program. Um, and, and that's on the street, so to speak. And uh, the, uh, uh, the administration will continue to try to get as much of this money on the street as it can uh, leading up to these uh, November uh, midterm elections. Uh, and so, but I would also say that this is most of this money is 
is going to be distributed over five years. So we, you know, we will probably see an application process for this low and no emissions grant program coming up soon, but it'll only be 1 billion out of that 5 billion. So we will have additional chances down the road to, uh, uh, to hone those applications and prove them if need be and, um, and, and time them in, in, a, in, a, in the right way. The, uh, the IIJA also includes, and this is where I talk about it, the, sort of the, this is not what I would call the new money. It includes a five-year reauthorization of federal surface transportation programs, including programs at the Federal Transit Administration, uh, which we participate in. Uh, it's about a 36% increase in existing formula and grant programs. Uh, Congress was probably gonna do this anyway, even if they didn't do the infrastructure bill, but they rolled it all in there. Uh, and so some highlights again, about 36% increase in existing formula and grant programs, a 50% increase in the, what we call the STIC program, the Small Transit Intensive Cities Program. And for those of you who don't know, this is a program that was created by Congress, uh, sort of at the urging of, of Santa Cruz Metro. We were, we were big players in the creation of this program. It, it, it's a formula program that provides sort of, a, it's sort of a bonus pool of money for high performing, smaller uh, transit agencies, those that serve urbanized areas of less than 200,000. And so we do very well through this program. Uh, we created it. And so um, thanks to Congressman Panetta and a few other members, uh, they got a 50% increase in that program um, in, in this uh, over the next five years. The 36% increase in formula funding adds up to probably uh, at least FTA estimates of about 3 million uh, additional uh, in additional funding annually for Metro. So that, you know, that's where we can say uh, what's in it for me. Uh, that's, that is hard money that uh, formula funding that is going to be guaranteed uh, over the next five years, um, you know, for, for the agency. So, next slide, please. Can I ask a question about this slide? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So the 5 billion for low, no emissions, yes, sir. That, is that out of the 21 billion for FTA? Yes, sir. Yeah, then, the other, the other. I'm sorry if I'm anticipating your question. Uh, the the um, the capital investment grants program, which funds light rail projects and uh, bus rapid transit things like that, they got a big chunk of money. Uh, and then some rural programs, uh, the ferry boat program, for instance, got some got some of that 21 mil, billion as well. Um, Director Rockin. And then the fact that there's um, the Department of Transportation got 550 billion in new money, but only 21 billion to FTA, the remainder goes to automobiles or rail or where's that money going? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're if if you're someone who was looking for um, this bill to really address climate change, there is some in there, but a lot of it goes to roads and bridges. Uh, half of the 500, so about 275 billion of the 550 billion goes to DOT. Uh, but still, yeah, a, a lot of it is going to um, to roads and bridges, uh, but uh, Amtrak gets a pretty big uh, chunk of money too. That's about sixty six billion dollars in there for what they call intercity passenger rail. Uh, most of it's going to go to Amtrak in some way. It's not that we have no interest in the road stuff. Right. I mean, our buses drive on roads, but I just, Absolutely. but in terms of the relative shares here and stuff, it's not as you point out. A majority of it's not going to public transit. It's going to other kinds of uh, uh, transportation modes. Let's say. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. About 130 billion of that 275 Thanks. is for federal highways. Thanks for answering my questions. Thanks. Uh, the next, uh, I'll just talk briefly about the Build Back Better, and uh, sadly, it's sort of you know the, the interest uh, uh, in in passing this in Congress seems to be waning uh, every day. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we we call it the, the president calls it Build Back Better. Uh, we call it kind of a human infrastructure plan, a social infrastructure plan. You can see in its original format, uh, as approved by the House last November, it had a bunch of money in it for childcare, universal pre-K, community college, lots of affordable housing. Uh, funding in there, uh, green energy assistance, home health aid, big big chunks of money in there. So it's about a $3.5 trillion uh, program as approved by the House in November of 2021. Uh, all paid for, offset with, uh, with, um, with um, inc uh, tax increases on wealthy folks and, and that sort of thing. But uh, that's, that's the size of the bill. Not a lot of transportation programs in that Build Back Better. There was kind of a handshake agreement between the president and the folks who did the IIJA. 
that the president wouldn't try to get more transportation money in, in this Build Back Better bill and make it bigger. Uh, but I will say that there's a couple of really attractive uh, uh, things in there, uh, $10 billion, so $2 billion, uh, $10 billion over five years, $2 billion a year for a, a new program that would be at the HUD and FTA, and it would be to sort of link affordable housing pro programs and projects uh, with transit service. And so, you know, you think about uh, uh, a, a downtown Watsonville um, uh, transit center or Pacific station, uh, as you read that legislation, they, they, they really dovetail per, you know, uh, perfectly into that. And then again, thanks to uh, Congressman Panetta and, and conversations that we've been having with him over the years, the, the Build Back Better as approved by the House has a 30% tax credit uh, for the purchase of zero emissions commercial vehicles, which, uh, which includes buses. Uh, and so that would be in the form of a, a rebate similar to what we get through the alternative the federal alternative fuels tax credit. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, this, this uh, the, again, as I said, interest in this bill, while it was passed by the House uh, along party lines in November, it needs all 50 Senate Democrats to pass. Uh, and uh, that's not the case right now. There's probably uh, about 46 or 47 Democrats who are supportive of Build Back Better and a couple of holdouts uh, uh, for various reasons. Uh, and so it's, uh, again, uh, like I said, sort of every day that we don't see a vote in the Senate on this, the, the White House has said that they are reaching out to the, to the Senate Democrats who are, are having heartburn with the bill, trying to, you know, pare it down in size, um, but I, you know, like I said, as we get closer and closer to the midterm elections in the summer and legislation is going to kind of, you know, hold, you know, stop, uh, you know, the, the, the chances of this build back better, um, uh, get, get slimmer and slimmer. And I do think that if we do get something out of it, that the, the those two programs above that I mentioned, uh, the, the tax credit and the, uh, the affordable housing program with, with transit would probably go by the wayside as they slim it down. So. Um, but, you know, the president's continuing to push. He's a little distracted right now with other stuff, but he is pushing and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, as are others. So. Uh, next slide, please. So the next is, you know, the, the fiscal year 22 budget for, you know, particularly for us, for the Department of Transportation. Uh, federal fiscal year 2022 formally started on October 1, 2021. So we're several months into 2022, but uh, for various reasons, Congress has not approved a final budget for FY 2022. And so uh, right now, uh, they're, uh, we're, the government is running under what they call a, a continuing resolution. It's basically a stopgap measure to avoid a shutdown, and it funds programs at their current level, so their FY 2021 levels, until the final budget is passed. Uh, that continuing resolution expires on March 11th. We're hopeful uh, that this will be the last continuing resolution that's needed, and Congress will approve that the, uh, an FY 2022 budget uh, that would include some increases for programs uh, that we care about. If, um, for instance, the reauthorization that I was talking about that's included in the IIJA, uh, the 36% increases uh, for formula grant programs begin with fiscal year 2022. So if Congress passed this year-long continuing resolution, if they couldn't decide on an FY 2022 budget and just kind of kick the can down the road and said, ah, we'll just do it at FY 21 levels and start the FY 23 process um, and forget about 2022, that could conceivably cost us about $3 million in new uh, money uh, with uh, formula funds. So I think everybody is hopeful that the, a final budget will pass and, and we, can, we can start with, the, with FY 2022 money. Um, but uh, you know, politics uh, is is a funny thing, and uh, and Congress could 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 get stalled uh, on this. We're we're hopeful it's not. So, uh, transportation, and as I say down here, transportation is really not the contentious thing. You know, and uh, it's it's more sort of par you know the Republicans and Democrats have some arguments over policy provisions in these spending bills that some people like, some people don't like, and and also uh, parity between defense and non-defense spending. Uh, Democrats have proposed about a 13, 14 percent increase in uh, increase in non-defense discretionary spending for FY22. Uh, while about a 5% increase in defense programs and Republicans would like that the delta between that to be a little bit um, uh, a little bit uh, smaller. 
And so that's uh, that's part of the problem as well. Uh, some people say, well, why don't we just pull out the transportation department budget if everybody likes it, pull that out and pass it and let's be on with it. Well, you need the, the stuff that everybody likes in order to make people swallow the, the pill that they don't like in that in that gigantic budget. It's, a, it's no way to legislate, but that's the way we're doing it right now uh, in DC. So uh, I think those were the big things. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these uh, expand or, or if I missed anything that you've been hearing, happy to talk about that too. Thank you, Chris. Good information. I see a hand from uh, Director Dutra. Hi. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you, Councilman? I'm good. I'm good. Nice good to see you. you. Um, two, two questions. One is, when was the last time we received a, like, a low-no grant or a grant that um, we were able to um, use for our, our system? What year was that? Yeah, I think, and maybe Wanda Moo, if he's here, and, or John, um, was, it, uh, was it 2017? That was 2016. Yeah, that was the 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 low no uh, grant. Yeah. So which twice. we didn't which we didn't spend for a while because we had problem issues. But you know Correct. that's when it, that's when we got the grant initially, and we just held on to it till we could spend it. <laughs> Director Commissary um, Johnson. Oh, I wasn't finished. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. That's oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Mike interrupted me, so I was. I, <laughs> uh, 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 Councilman uh, Dutra too, I might, and Wondermoo can probably expand on this too. I might say there's, there's also been sort of this, you know, kind of um, uh, because of the big difference, right, between the cost of a compressed natural gas bus and, a, and, a, and, a, and an electric bus, we've been sort of looking at both, right? And so like, you know, as opposed to saying, oh, we need 50 new, uh, you know, $50 million for 50 new low, uh, electric buses, uh, looking at looking at kind of layering that process uh, while we while we still can. So. so thank you. I think that's uh, you know 2016. That's that's a while ago, and I think that it sets us up pretty nicely to be competitive um, in the next round of grants. So I, I think that you know maybe working with our staff, we should figure out what you know our a match could be, so that we could um, you know put in a really strong um, submission for these um, for for this next round. Um, what do you feel? Do you do? You, is there anything that we could be doing to, um, you know, make to be successful? Yeah, I think I think you've been doing it over the years, right? You know, sort of, you know, uh, you know, approving that plan, you know, the 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 uh, the fleet, uh, um, you know, turnover plan, uh, you know, passing, uh, you know, local transportation measures, you know, that say we've got skin in the game, uh, and you know, being able to provide that match. Uh, I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot. This administration um, uh, really uh, is, uh, is, is favoring projects that address uh, equity issues. Uh, and I think that, uh, that a lot of, a lot of pu public transportation kind of is all about equity, right? And so uh, if we can, you know, kind of talk about how the services we're providing in, uh, in places like Watsonville, I think that that makes for a strong uh, application. Great, thank you. We'll we'll be in touch then. Great. <laughs> even Absolutely. more so. Even Absolutely. more so. Uh, Director Kalantari Johnson. Thank you so much. Thanks for that presentation. Really, a lot of rich information. I wanted to ask about the IIJA. You mentioned that sixty percent of the funds are in the form of formula block grants um, that would get doled out to states. So, how much room is there for local communities to advocate with? Um, our representatives to ensure that our state and our region get some of those funding. How much does the formula block grant piece restrict us from doing the advocating? What would you recommend? Sure, yeah, thanks council member. It's a good question. Uh, it really does depend by uh, on the program. So for instance, uh, just recently, uh, Caltrans got a, you know, got a big chunk of money for bridges from the Department of Transportation through the IIJA, uh, but the Department of Trans, the Federal Department of Transportation gives, gives Caltrans pretty, a pretty wide berth as to how to spend that money. They could spend it on all state-owned bridges, or they could, you know, use it on what they call off-system bridges. Uh, it's really kind of up to them. So yeah, I think on the, on the local level, advocating with Caltrans that, you know, that you've got, um, you've got projects that are in need of, of funding makes makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, you know, again, this isn't transit related, but 
cybersecurity. There's a big chunk of money for cybersecurity. The IIJ actually specifically said that states will get that formula grant money, but they must pass 80% of it on to local uh, entities. So knowing that kind of helps you, you know, um, uh, to, uh, to do battle in Sacramento, so to speak. Thank you. I have one follow-up question. Um, you mentioned with the Build Back Better that likely what's going to go is the 10 billion for um, yeah. 10 billion for the HUD FTA affordable housing and transit program and the 30% tax credit. Uh, I mean, our community is just so prime for those opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> what can we do to help save them? Or is it just, does it do we say goodbye? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, like I said, we've got we've got a strong uh, we've got a congressional delegation that is strongly in favor of these, you know, and like I'd mentioned before, the 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 tax credit for the you know the commercial the electric commercial vehicles was was authored by Congressman Panetta, uh, and so uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, it's it's folks in West Virginia and Arizona. So if you know anybody there, uh, <laughs> you know they're they're kind of the folks who are who are stopping this, or I, I don't know if they're necessarily stopping it, but they're saying it's too large. They think that inflation is you know kind of out of control, and they don't want to do too much more federal spending. And so that that's at least what they're saying with regard to that. But I will say that uh, you know that 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 even if Congress doesn't approve the funding for this these programs, this administration does actually kind of look at those look at those things uh, in a in a positive light. And so there hopefully will be other uh, competitive programs that we can look at. Uh, that we can say, hey, we look, we're providing these services, um, you know, in, in you know, in conjunction with affordable housing, and and I think this administration would would uh, would think that that's a competitive proposal. Great, thank you so much again for sure. all this great information. Yeah, my pleasure. Any other questions, directors? Chris, great information. Appreciate your uh, efforts on all of this, and uh, keep in touch. I will. Thank you very much. Great job. Thanks for representing yeah. us. Thank you. Okay, moving along, we're on to the uh, Pacific Station update from John Ergo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. As has been uh, reported at previous board meetings, the Pacific Station North project, which includes Metro's uh, bus tarmac, uh, new operator break room and facilities, ticket and counter, and a 95 unit affordable housing community, uh, affordable. Housing development has received over $50 million in state competitive grant awards in recent months, including 20 million in infrastructure and a 30 million affordable housing and sustainable at communities grant. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update on process and schedule. So from talking with the developers and our party and our partners at the city, it looks like construction should begin in November, 2023. So we're looking to probably move out of the current Pacific station uh, for the fall bid in 2023 into a temporary facility. And then the city uh, has expressed an interest in amending the current MOU that we have uh, between Metro and the city, uh, which as a quick reminder, uh, this, this board has approved, I think in 2020, uh, where uh, Metro has committed, for, committed to contribute $4 million in exchange for a turnkey project. Uh, I don't have any more details on what the city wants uh, to amend, but we'll be bringing that before a future capital uh, committee in March or April. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you, John. Any uh, questions, directors? Uh, Director Kalantari Johnson. I just wanted to thank um, John for the update and thank the Metro for the continued partnership with the city. Yes. Um, I do see a hand from uh, James Sandoval. James, would you like to comment, please? Uh, yeah, first permission to uh, speak on the previous agenda item. I had my hand raised and it was- I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Okay, it, so it's fine? Do go ahead. Okay, um, so I just, I think it's an appropriate spot to bring it up. You know, I, what we did for the PERB legislation thing was, um, you know, to meet deadlines. Obviously nothing's official, nothing's finalized. And uh, we are working with our attorney. And um, as far as I know, procedurally, we didn't do anything wrong. And I wanna still remain inclusive as much as possible for Metro. So I'm proposing, or I'm hoping to get the drafted language for uh, what's the spot bill is SB 957. So that way we continue to be as a team 
and and continue moving forward working together and um you know and 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 to in a response to the things that were brought up about how i handled it and stuff i'm, I'm a little disappointed i will say things were taken out a little out of context but i just um i hope everyone understands that i had every great intention with this to making sure everything operates uh, as smooth as possible for metro to protect metro and to protect metro workers from any unfair labor practices in the future i'm not accusing this board of ever doing that I'm not accusing of anybody or any history of it happening. I'm just preventing it or wanting to prevent it from it happening moving forward. So, um, you know, uh, we have the language, like I said, if we could somehow work together on trying to make it the team effort from the public and the board to make that decision together, I'm, I'm all ears. And I, I just, I just want to make sure that we're continuing to be on the same page. And um, that, that's all I had to say on that. Thank you. Thank you, James. And I know it's on a future agenda item. We'll keep tracking this issue. Any other questions or comments on uh, John's presentation? Anything else? I think we've reached the end of our meeting. Um, announcing the next regular board meeting, uh, the director's meeting will be Friday, March 25th at 9 a.m. We'll again do it by teleconference. And I do want to remind folks that we have links to a special meeting this afternoon. I hope you've all received the uh, links to closed session and open session. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Good job of sharing your first meeting, Larry. Thank you, Mike. It's all new to me. Congrats, Larry. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your support, everyone. See you later. Good job. Thank you.